Thank you. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Turning to Mary, the mother of the Lord, and our mother, asking her to intercede for us, to help us to receive everything God wants us to receive on this day of retreat or recollection, let us together pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, when I told you before that I'm happy to be back in Buffalo, I meant it. Um, the last time I tried to come to Buffalo, uh, I didn't make it. It's very rare that I don't make it to an event that I'm scheduled. I've uh, all I've done for 10 years, this year is my 10th anniversary as a priest, the only thing I've ever done is preach. Uh, from the day I was ordained, I was never assigned to a parish, I never did anything else, I'm a preacher. And we knew that that's what I would do long before I was ordained. My superiors knew it. He discerned it in the first 10 minutes <laughs> that he ever met me. And actually, I, I never spoke. I never spoke publicly. Matter of fact, when I was growing up in upstate New York, you know, back in, in the good old days, uh, you, you do know how you, you've arrived, don't you? you? You know that you've arrived when you receive your membership card in AARP. <laughs> I have arrived. In any event, you know, I'm half a century or so old. I'll be 54 in May. And... I grew up in a small town in upstate New York, Hudson, New York, is my hometown. And, um, you know, in those days, Buffalo was further away than it is today. All right? You know, it, because it was a major undertaking. If you, if you took a trip to Buffalo, uh, especially in the winter, you know, you were courageous or crazy, one or the other. Uh, but anyway, you know, I, I grew up in the same kind of a town as many of, many of you did. And I feel comfortable. For some reason now, I have preached all over the place. I've preached in 47 states. It's the only thing I've done. Ten years, day in, day out. Uh, difficult, living out of a suitcase. Um, I have a home, more or less, now that I go in and out of. I don't see it very often. But uh, Buffalo is one of those places, you know, in going so many places, every once in a while one clicks. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because you and I are alike in many basic ways. Um, we grew up the same way. I don't know what it is. The water? I don't know. But, <laughs> you know, the agony of watching the bills season <laughs> after season. You know, whatever it is, you know, all those things kind of uh, make us... I don't know, family. Uh, I've always felt comfortable. Now, I've preached in the Buffalo area before, of course. I've gone to the Carmelite Monastery in Buffalo, did a couple of novenas there. The last time I tried to come, I didn't make it. I ended up in the hospital for several days. That's unusual. I think I've missed four, I think four events in 10 years. Uh, I never missed one because of uh, an airplane, which is amazing to me. Last night was the closest I ever came. It was a terrible day, weather all, we flew through storms, and then um, the airline's problems, they didn't have a crew, and you know, I was going to offer to fly the plane if I had to. <laughs> I don't know how to fly a plane, but I had to do something. I'm going to give five talks today. We're going to have to condense it, put it together. It's a Lenten retreat. All right, Lent starts Wednesday, but hey, you know what? We're coming up to Lent. We'll have a Lenten day of retreat today. I'm going to talk about God's mercy first. It's something close to my heart, mainly because I've received more of it than most people. Why have I received more of it than most people? Because I need more of it than most people. 
Mercy is a very special thing. God is mercy. God is rich in mercy. Our Heavenly Father is rich in mercy, the Bible tells us. In recent times, our Father, through His Son, in the power of the Holy Spirit, revealed about this mystery of mercy to us and to Sister Faustina, saint now, that image of the divine mercy, you've seen it, of Jesus with the rays coming out of his heart. God's name is mercy. He's so very merciful. Now, what does that mean to us? Well, it's good news, for one thing, because we need it. But it also means that we are called to be merciful. Mercy is a two-edged sword. This is very important. This is enormously important. Please listen to this. You've been given much. I have been given much. Much will be required of us. To the man or woman who has been given more, and we, because we have the Catholic faith, we've been given more. To the man or woman who's given more, more will be required. We've been given a lot of mercy. We have to be merciful. Now, how does that translate into daily life? You've got to examine yourself. You know, we're coming into Lent, time for self-examination. Lent is a time of preparation, kind of like Advent, which is also a time of preparation. Lent is that time where you take a serious look at yourself. And this is important. Be honest. One of the talks I'm going to give today is on humility, which is absolutely essential for salvation, absolutely essential for that holiness of life which helps you to save your soul. No humility, no holiness. Now, part of humility, or really the essence of humility, is to acknowledge the truth. What you need to do is be honest and objective. Reality check. You look at your soul, you look at yourself honestly. One of the worst curses in history is that Catholics are just as sinful as anybody else. Now, we're human, just like anybody else, sure. But we're called to transcend sin. We're given the power of grace to do that. We have the sacraments to do that. But most people act like a Savior never came, suffered, died, and rose on the third day. Do you know why more people don't come into the Catholic Church? Do you think it's their fault? You think, oh, well, they're dumb or they're, 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 you know, sinners, this, that. It's our fault. Now, at times when I speak, every now and then some of you, will have a twinge of, I don't want that. You know, I don't like what he said. I understand that. I apologize for any discomfort that I cause you. However, cause it I will. <laughs> Why? You need it, and so do I. Hey, you just got to listen to me for a few hours today. Then, oh, happy day, I'm out of here. I got to listen to me day in and day out. <laughs> God made me a preacher because I need it more than you. You know, a few hours helps you out. You're good people. Me? I'm one of those hard cases. Now, you know, I grew up in an Italian family. And it was that my, the family didn't speak Italian in the house. You know, this was in the day, it's unfortunate, but you know, immigrants, uh, somehow, because people that were already here made them, made them feel that where they came from wasn't good, I think. You know, they felt inferior because they didn't speak the language and so forth and so on. But we didn't speak Italian in the home. I mean, it, my grandparents did a little bit, but they never taught us Italian. But I learned a few words.
My Uncle Tony used to lovingly refer to me as Chooch. You see, the Italian people here know about that. Jackass. Hard-headed, you know, testadura. You know, just instead of brick for a head. You know, stubborn and so forth. You and I need to hear it. Now, some of what I'm going to say through the course of the day, you'll have resistance to it. That's natural. That's all right. Some of it might even hurt you. You know what happens when you poke somebody in a wounded place with a sharp instrument? It hurts. They jump. We all have wounds. Wounds come from sin. The truth is a two-edged sword. The Bible tells us the word of God's a two-edged sword. That's sharp. It cuts right to the heart. Don't worry about that. Be humble. Be humble. If I say anything that makes you jump, it's okay. I, I'm supposed to do that. That's my job. That's what a mission preacher does. Dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. And so, that's what we do. Lent, make this the best Lent of your life. Okay, it's coming up Wednesday. we got a head start. You know, you're the, I've got eight in a row. You're the first one. It starts Wednesday. Hey, this will be over by then. I hope it can prepare you to make the best Lent, the best preparation for the Paschal Mystery for Easter that you could possibly have. This can change your life. This should change your life. I'm a simpleton. I'm very, very simple. When I finished my doctoral studies, when I received my fifth university degree, and I received them all with highest honors, the mentor or director of my doctoral thesis said to me, well, you've come to the end of the line, finally. You've gotten every degree you can possibly get. You just can't get any more formal education. Now, tell me, what is it that you have learned? And I said to him, without even thinking, it just was, came naturally, I said, well, I've learned that I don't know anything. He said, great, you're an educated man. <laughs> we haven't wasted our time totally with you. Compared to God, that's what we're studying, right? When we study the faith, we're studying God himself. We know so little, it's like the head of a pin. St. Thomas Aquinas, the greatest theologian in the history of the church, when he came to the end of his long and illustrious life, he, he said he, all this knowledge that he had, and he had a lot, he said, all of it is so much straw. And you come up against the grandeur, the infinite majesty of God, well, it's just a little bit of straw. But it's important. Mercy. If you have all the knowledge in the world, if you have all the power in the world, if you have all the money in the world, and yet you don't make God present through your life, especially through mercy, you're a zero. Remember, when we get out of here, when we die, and, you know, we don't like to talk about You ever notice that in our culture, we don't like to talk about death too much? You know, we don't want to, like to hear about that. Padre Pio, blessed Padre Pio, used to remind people, especially uh, rich people, people who were dressed up in fancy clothes and stuff like that. He used to, he was very earthy and he was very direct. At one time, a, a lady came to him and uh, she wanted to have him say something nice. It was her 70th birthday and she was dressed up in fancy clothes, unlike the peasant women who used to come to the monastery. And she said, now, now, Father, say something nice to me. It's my 70th birthday. And he leaned over and he whispered in, in her ear, death is near. <laughs> Soon you will be food for worms. A comforting thought. Now the fact of the matter is, we get preoccupied with a million and one things. There's only one thing important, getting to heaven. And don't you forget it. You can make all the money in the world, you can achieve all the worldly power, prestige. You don't get to heaven, you're a zero, you're a failure. The only definitive failure in a human life is the failure to get to heaven, period. 
Now that's very simple. All right. I think you believe that. Now look, if you don't believe that there's a heaven and a hell, you're in big trouble. There are big shot theologians who don't believe in hell, you know. There was a guy on the West Coast who had a doctorate degree in religious education. He formed all the catechists on most of the West Coast. He didn't believe in the existence of hell. He was, not, he was a heretic. You know what that word means, heretic? Okay. You know what heresy is? Heresy is an obstinate post-baptismal denial of some element of faith and morals which must be accepted with divine and Catholic faith or an obstinate doubt concerning saints. He didn't believe what we believe. Now, there are a lot of people today who don't believe what we believe. Now, I don't mind if a Buddhist doesn't believe what we believe. I'd like him to. I'd like him to come to the fullness of truth. Uh, or, or a Baptist or a Presbyterian, they're very close. They believe most of what we believe. But I'm talking about Catholics. We are at war. And our war is not against flesh and blood. The devil is real. One of the first times I ever preached, I was totally unknown right out of the university. I'd just received my doctorate. And I was invited because somebody knew, hey, he has, he has a doctorate. Maybe he knows something. We'll fill in a spot. And there was some well-known liberal theologian there giving a talk, and it went something like this. He said, well, now, you know, we really don't believe in the existence of angels and demons. That's just what we call a literary device used in Scripture to make a point. There was an elderly woman in the front pew sitting next to a, a friend of hers, and she leaned over and she said, I wish one of those literary devices would come down and kick his butt. <laughs> And he went on and he said, we don't really believe in hell because after all, a good God could never have a hell. And he went on and on and on and he basically denied half the tenets of the faith. Now this is the guy who's teaching. Finally, he finished and he went down. Wouldn't you know it, he sat right in the front pew next to the old lady. Now she had reached that age where she didn't care. <laughs> If you know what I mean. <laughs> and she fidgeted about, and finally she just couldn't stand it anymore, and she leaned over and whispered in his ear, Father, you don't believe in hell? He said, oh, no. She said, you'll believe it when you get there. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, my point is not to dwell on those negative things. Uh, suffice it to know that's real. It's very simple. You know, the way you learned the faith when you were a kid, it hasn't changed. It might seem like it's changed, but no. Externals can change. Discipline can change. But doctrine cannot and will not ever change. It's the truth. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is a God, there is a Satan, there is a heaven, there is a hell. There's a right way and a wrong way. There's light and darkness, truth and lies, good and evil. That's very simple, consummately simple. Let's not complicate a very, very simple thing. And our faith is simple because our faith concerns God. And God, by definition, theologically speaking, is pure simplicity. Mercy. God's very essence is mercy. God is mercy. Now, if that's true, and it is, I assure you, what about us? We are the single biggest obstacle to the salvation of souls that exist. Oh, yeah, the devil works, but you can't blame everything on the devil. We have a free will. And that's a powerful thing. You and I keep people out of the church. You know, you know how? Oh, let me count the ways. We're bigoted. I remember when I was growing up, I played sports. You know, in that typical upstate New York town. There was one street where black people lived. And everybody thought they belonged there. I remember, now my father was not a prejudiced man. He was kind of unusual. Uh, he, he really wasn't. I never heard him say a bad word about someone's race. But let me tell you something. Catholics were just as bigoted 
Catholics were just as racially motivated as everybody else. You'd hear out of the mouths of Catholics, just as you would any pagan, the worst racial slurs. Wasn't any different. Do you know that the divorce rate among Catholics is the same as it is for the rest of the country? No different. Catholics are just as miserable as everybody else. Why on earth would anybody want to come into Catholic Church? You know, they take a look at some of us and say, hey, that's what it is? Ooh, no thanks. When they look at you, there should be something special. When they look at you, there should be something attractive about your life, a magnet. That's what I'm talking about. This Lent, I want you to try to allow the Holy Spirit to help you to be all you can be, like the Army commercial, you know, be all you can be. God wants great things from us. See, we're baptized into Christ. If you ever have an identity crisis, you've heard that term in psychology, sociology, identity crisis. We, we live in the era of the identity crisis. Hmm? Priests have had identity crisis. No, we don't know who we are. We don't know the meaning, the, the relevance of our life. Religious have had, rele have had those identity crises. Well, what's, you know, religious sisters very often. I came in and our beautiful sisters in the back when I passed them. Uh, in an instant, I, I remembered my, my life when I was young. How the church was enriched by these beautiful religious sisters who give their life to Jesus their spouse, and who did great work, and still do great work in the church. But often, and I don't blame them, and I don't blame the priests that have had it, but, you know, identity crisis. We wonder, you know, the world changes. I'm, you know, what, am I worth anything anymore? Is my vo vocation relevant? What is this? We have a crisis of identity. Married people. Well, I don't, you know, this marriage. I don't know. We, we change. We've grown apart. You're not the same person I married. I hope not. You're 50 years old. Well, you're the same person. <laughs> you're the same person. But, you know, d different. You know, certain things do change. And it's hard. We have to adapt. But that identity crisis, if you ever have an identity crisis and you're not quite sure where you came from or where you're headed or even where you are right now, you know what that's called? That's a description of being lost. Someone who has an identity crisis is lost. Now, that's not a curse. I'm not saying that in a derogatory manner. I've had it myself. I, you know, I used it when I was a kid growing up, and I still do it. I like the outdoors. I was an absolute fanatic fisherman, hunter, always in the woods, always out on some lake or river fishing, and I still do it when I can. But you ever, you ever get lost in the woods? When I was a kid, Every now and then, I, I love to hunt somewhere. I'd be out in the woods, you know, and, and dusk would be coming and start get dark in the woods. And maybe you get turned around a little bit and every, every tree starts to look the same. You know, of course, I was never, being a great woodsman, I was never lost, just temporarily confused, <laughs> as Daniel Boone once said. But we don't know where we came from. Look, we came from God, right? Simple. We came from God. He's the creator. Where are we headed? We're headed back to God. Where are we right now? We should be in God. You want to know your identity, priest, religious, lay people, whether married or single. I'm going to, I, and I can do it wonderfully here in this beautiful church. I always like it when I have these, these helpers. Look up here. Look at this magnificent, very large crucifix. That's your identity. Take a good long look at it. Meditate on it for the rest of your life. That is your identity. And if you try to go anyplace else, you're going the wrong way. Now, does that frighten you? Yeah, me too. Does that make you nervous? Me too. But you know what? You can't get out of it. And neither can I. Jesus was born to die. We're born to die. But we're baptized in him. And so we can live in him. We can suffer in him. We can die in him. And you know what? You die with him, you're going to rise with him. 
And if you rise with him, you're going to reign with him forever. That's very simple. That's absolute simple teaching. I know you can do that. You can get that. That's the point of your life. Anything that is taking you away from that, get rid of it. It's garbage. Your job is to get to heaven. My job is to get to heaven. Love is a word that's used quite frequently and loosely today. In the church, we have all kinds of sermons on love. Most people don't have a clue what love is. Every once in a while in traveling, a good pastor will say, you know, I've got a couple getting married. They're doing the pre-Cana counseling now. You know, I, I, I really, I'm not reaching them. Maybe you can help me while you're here. Would you talk to them? I said, well, okay. I don't know what good it will do, but I'll, I'll try. Normally, I can't do things anywhere near as well as the parish priest can because they have a very special gift. They have a very special ministry. They're called to that, and they're given the gifts to do it. I have a gift for doing what I do, but I don't have a lot of the gifts that your parish priest would have. So anyway, on the appointed night of the pre-Cana conference, the young couple, come, they come in. You know, Instead of the benevolent, happy, smiling face of the pastor, they see me. <laughs> the grand inquisitor. And I said, so, you're going to be getting married. Oh, that's wonderful. You must be in love. Oh, well, yeah, Father, sure. We're in love. That, that's why we're getting married, you know. Wonderful. Catholics, getting married. Experts on love. Could you please tell me what is love? Well, you know, Father, now this, this is in New York, okay? We're doing this in New York. Well, you know, Father, love. Hey, Father, we got feelings. <laughs> You know, we got, we got feelings. Hey, if all you got is feelings, man, feelings are up one day and down the next. You'd be like a yo-yo and the devil's pulling the string. Feelings? You better have more than feelings. What else? And the blushing bride-to-be mind to say, oh, oh, you know, Father, we have chemistry. <laughs> man, that could blow up. <laughs> you better have more than chemistry. Come on, what's love? Come on, you experts on love. And they, they almost never get it. So I help them. How about this? If you love somebody, you desire the highest and best thing for that person. They can never argue with that. I mean, you could give other definitions that it'd be okay. There are other elements to it. But you have to accept that if you love somebody, you want the highest and best thing. You want the best for your wife, your husband. I said, yeah, okay, that's fine. Good. What's that? Well, um, how about a nice house? Some children? Good. You know, early retirement? Mm -hmm. A doggy named Spot? Mm -hmm. What else? What else? Well, come on, Father, what else, man, what else can there be? And then you give him the punchline. I do it like my grandmother used to do it. How about heaven? <laughs> How about heaven? If you desire the highest and best thing for the one you love, whoever that is, wife, husband, children, parents, pastor, congregation, if you desire, if you love someone, you desire the highest and best thing. And that's heaven. There is nothing higher and nothing better than eternal salvation. If I love you, and I do, if I love you, I want you in heaven forever. That's mercy. That's mercy. And I have to be willing to do anything and everything to get you there. You might not want to go. You may prefer to sin. You may prefer to live a very worldly and sinful existence. Hey, I sympathize with it. I did it for 20 years. I lived like an outright pagan. I should have known better. I was brought up Catholic. I had a good family. I, they made me, my mom, I was in church every Sunday. You better believe it. And there'd be, you know what to pay if I wasn't. It wasn't my family's fault. 
but I drifted away. Now, if I love you, I want you in heaven. You parents, you love your children, and sometimes they start to go off, you know, in, in the teenage years, you know, and you grandparents agonize over, oh, little Johnny, Johnny's not going to church, you know? Oh, you know, Susie got tied up with that Harry Krishna guy, and, uh, you know, they're out selling flowers at the airport. <laughs> not good. You know, and you're doing novenas. Praying the rosy, lighting candles. Oh, my family lit candles. Man, we lit some candles. My family lit more candles. My grandparents should have bought stock in the candle company because I'll tell you what. So you're doing all that. You, want, you, you know what's bad. You, you want your children, your grandchildren. You love them. Sure you do. And you want them to do the right thing. And you know that if they don't, they're not going to be happy. So you have a certain wisdom. When you're younger, you don't have that wisdom. And, and any of us at any age have lapses of wisdom. I take this very seriously. You see, I was on the wrong side of the tracks for 20 years. I went the wrong way. I was the kid who grew up in the small town, good family, Catholic upbringing, back in the 50s and 60s. But you know how it was in the 60s? Remember, some of you are my age. You know, the, the age, our battle cry was, I gotta be free, I gotta be me. You know, we, some of us were at Woodstock. You know, some of you girls wore flowers in your hair. And you're so pretty. But then you went down the wrong way, you know. One thing leads to another, to another, to another. And before you know it, you got one foot in hell. And one foot on a banana peel. Not today we don't like to talk straight. We've turned into a very spineless, weak-kneed generation that can't countenance straight talk. But we need it. Like it or not. Make you uncomfortable, maybe you need to be uncomfortable. If you're living in sin, and I know that a lot of you aren't living in mortal sin, I'm not really talking to you, but I gotta talk to you who talk to others, right? We're, our, my job is to form the formators. You who are the heads of families. You who have the spiritual welfare of your children and grandchildren at heart. All of us are our brother's keeper. All of us have to care about the one and only thing that matters, getting to heaven. Very simple. And how to do it. You have no mercy if you don't care. You're not like God if you're not merciful. Now how does the mercy manifest itself in so many ways? You've heard of the Spiritual and corporal works of mercy. Feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty. Clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, comfort the imprisoned. Visit the sick, bury the dead. Now those corporal works of mercy, that's how we live out mercy. Now God's the one whose name is mercy. But we are called to make God present. Listen, no one's ever going to meet the living God unless they meet him through you. That's how they're going to encounter Christ, is through a Christian. It's hard sometimes. Now, do you look on certain classes of people with disdain? Do you despise them? How about homeless people? Well, they're no good, they don't work. They ought to get a job. They ought to do this. How about alcoholics and drug addicts? How about prostitutes? How about anybody that you think is less than you? I got news for you. You and I, and you and I are very alike. I, I, I can say this here around Buffalo because I honestly feel a closeness to you. We're, we're family, we're all family all over the world, of course, as humans and as Christians. But in a special way, you and I have more in common. So I, 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 I can say this to you in a very special, intimate way. You and I would be worse than the worst murderer, drug addict, prostitute, thief that ever lived except for the grace of God. You'd be in prison, and so would I, except for the grace of God. You'd be abusing children. So would I, except for the grace of God. And don't you forget it. You think you're hot stuff? Like my grandma used to say, you're too big for your britches. 
All of us. Me at the head of the list. St. Paul said that he felt that God had preserved him as an extreme example to show that mercy's for everybody. I say that I relate to that passage from St. Paul so much. I really believe God preserved me as an extreme example to give witness to the whole world that, hey, if your sins are as scarlet, they can be made whiter than snow. No matter how bad your sin, God can forgive them in the twinkling of an eye. If only you'll go to them and ask him for forgiveness. That, that's called contrition. You know, we're sorry for our sins. We have a firm purpose of amendment. We can't guarantee anything, but we're sincere. We're going to do the best we can. And then you receive mercy. We've got to do it. The spiritual works of mercy, you know, admonish the sinner, that's a hard one. Instruct the uninformed, lots of opportunity for that. Counsel the doubtful, a lot of people doubtful. Comfort the sorrowful. I've been a priest almost 10 years. I'm very, believe me, I'm very thankful for the priesthood. But it's killing me. I have seen so much sorrow in 10 years. Oh, I saw it in the, my life before. But I guess I never had the same eyes before. And my sensitivity to it, maybe it's a blessing. And yet it's a two-edged sword of a blessing because the other side of the sword, that sensitivity to suffering and pain, it hurts. I can't hardly stand to look at it anymore. I've seen some of the worst, you know, every place I go, I see it, in one form or another. My husband just died from cancer, Father. He suffered for years. My wife is suffering with this. My children are in prison. I can only dimly imagine the pain that a parent can suffer for a child. My little sister was killed in a car accident when she was 14. Now, my mother suffered very much because of it, but I can't hardly imagine the depth of that pain. And I meet parents all over who suffer like that, spouses who suffer, priests who suffer. In the last several years, I've had many priests come to me, maybe because of certain notoriety I might have from television or whatever, I don't know why. But they'll come to me, and, and I guess it's my testimony. They, they know that I kind of came up the rough way, that I had a rough life. And maybe they have a problem, you know. The, the priesthood's not easy. Nothing's easy. Not easy to be married, not easy to be a priest. I'm not saying it's any worse than what you have to suffer. But they'll come and they'll tell me about being rejected by their own brothers, by their bishop. They'll tell me about being marginalized, about being lonely and unhappy. Some of them start to drink. That's nothing new. Some of them even do drugs. Some of them get in trouble morally. I look at that whole, that ocean of sorrow. And my only response can be mercy. Can I judge them and say, oh, he should have been true to his vocation. Uh, she should have stayed in the convent. Is it? No, I can't do that. I feel pain for them. I wish good for them. I ask for God's mercy for them. Mercy is a godly thing. Can you be merciful? Can you feed the hungry? Do you know there are people hungry right in the streets of Buffalo? I myself was a homeless man. Sure, I grew up in that town in upstate New York. I followed the American dream. I caught it. I became very wealthy. Poor boy becomes rich boy. I did it on my own. I worked hard. 
multimillionaire. Then running with the fast lane set, movie stars, the rock stars, my clients, and my business in California and Los Angeles in the old day, 25 years ago. I became a drug addict, cocaine addict. $10,000 a week at times I spent, back in the late 70s, early 80s. I've, ha I've even had people, you know, you know, one thing, every once in a while, it's funny how God works. Every once in a while, someone who's out of it will say, you know, that priest that's going around doing that, yeah. he's got a very bad past. You shouldn't let him come in there. You know what he did? And then someone said, Ten, millions of people know what he did. What the heck are you talking about? <laughs> See how God works? God can defuse a potential disaster. God brings good even out of evil. God doesn't will the evil. But God works all things for the good for those who love him. And even if you have bad things in your past, the mercy of God can transform them into good things. It's never too late. Never too late. Oh, yeah, I had every advantage and went the wrong way. I got no excuse. I was one of those who had been given much, didn't do much with it, squandered it. Like the prodigal son, you know, the parable in the Gospel of Luke. The prodigal son, he took his inheritance, ran off and squandered it, ended up destitute. Humbled himself, remember this. He came back and he humbled himself to his father. If you're a sinner, you need to be humble. There's nobody in here who isn't a sinner. And the ones who think they're so good, you might be worse than that criminal in prison. I don't know what he was given. Maybe he grew up in the inner city, never saw his father, his mama was on crack. Maybe he never had a chance. Maybe he never got a chance to go to church. Maybe he didn't have a good mother like I did, good grandma, grandfather, the rest of my relatives did everything to help me go the right way. Maybe he didn't have that. Maybe he's better than I am. Except for the grace of God, there go I. And, you know, that could be anything. Remember that. Whenever you're tempted to look down your nose at somebody, you remember that. Except for the grace of God, there go I. Jesus ran into the self-righteous Pharisees in his day who looked down their noses at sinners. Oh, I'm glad I'm not like that man. Oh, no, I'm good. I fast. I tithe. I do this. I do that. See how good I am. A lot of Catholics like that. When I preached in my hometown, when I was first starting out on Sunday, there was a woman who'd call up my mother's house after the sermon every Sunday morning, and she'd complain. Now, I've been a Catholic 60 years. I don't need to hear that. I don't need some upstart like you telling me about sins and this and that. And she'd go on and on and on and on. She's the one who needed it. The guy who was in the back of the church, a homeless guy, would come in. And he was afraid to even come up in the front because he was homeless. He was an alcoholic. He had the same clothes on day in and day out. He was dirty. He'd sit in the back of the church and he'd cry. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And that arrogant woman who boasted of being a, quote, Catholic for so long, she was not justified. The poor man in the back who said, Lord, have mercy on him. He didn't even dare come up to the front. Why? He knew he was a sinner. Humility is the acknowledgement of truth. It's essential. God's mercy is there. Are you a dispenser, a conduit of mercy? Are you a conduit of mercy or an obstacle to mercy? When people come in contact with you, are you judgmental, bigoted, closed-minded, narrow, rigid, and so forth and so on? Or are you compassionate? Are you loving? Are you quick to show forth the mercy of God? Do you know what my name means, the Hebrew derivation of John? Johannine. 
to show forth the mercy of God. That's what the name means. You know what the name Jesus means? Jesus. God who saves. Or Savior. Names were very important in antiquity. They made present, they manifested the one who carried the name. We all carry the name of God, Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah. We are all Christians. How did God save? Through an act of mercy. His passion, death, and resurrection. Do we enter into that Paschal mystery, in fact, in our daily lives? Are you merciful? I remember when I was at my low point, I remember being in the streets, homeless, brokenhearted. I mean, I was in my middle 30s. I had risen from a poor boy in a modest beginning to become a wealthy, successful man, then lost it all through my own stupidity. You know, you could say, yeah, well, it was your own fault. I, I, yes, it was. It was my own fault, my own stupidity. Yes. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone, as Jesus said. I remember being at my low point, sitting in the park. Hadn't eaten for two or three days. Had no money. Clothes on my back and group of people came along and spit on me. It was prob I, I don't know, reducing a human being, treating them in a way that strips their dignity from them, makes them feel worse like that, that's a hellish thing to do. That's what Satan does. Oh, I don't want those Mexicans moving in here. The Puerto Ricans, whatever. And that comes out of the mouths of a lot of Catholics. Oh, those black people cause all the trouble. Out of the mouths of so-called Christians and Catholics. You better not carry that sin to your grave, if you have that sin. Are you a fountain of mercy? Is God's mercy overflowing from you? I couldn't have been any further down than I was, other than being dead. I spent a year in a hospital, VA hospital, a VA psychiatric hospital. Not one person ever came to visit me, ever. I had hundreds of so-called friends and acquaintances. But when I went down, not a one. My mother is the only person that ever visited me. Visit the sick. Do you visit the sick? Those in nursing homes, your own parents sometimes. How many elderly people languish? Only rejected, they raise families, nobody even shows up. Works of mercy. God is merciful. How merciful was God? Let me tell you how merciful God was for me. You, you know, you don't really know me. A lot of you know my little story. But you don't know how really rotten I was. And I was. Bad. You name it. I did it. All ten, many times over, broke all the Ten Commandments. Twenty years I didn't set foot in a church. Drug addict. In the gutter. Literally, I'd wake up mornings, wouldn't even know where I was or what had happened. The filth, the scum of the earth. I believe our Lord one day looked down and saw that mess, and he turned to his mother and said, Would you look at that? You ever seen anything so bad? And she said, Yeah, I, I, I'm going to go down and take a closer look at this. And I can well imagine our lady looking at me like a mother would look at a, a little child who fell in a pig trough or something, you know. Ah, what a mess. 
And you know what mothers do, they clean up their children. So she took me and she bathed me in the blood of her son, washing my sins away. Oh, I ended up going to confession, all right. Went to Orysville, you know, the shrine of the North American martyrs. I remember coming home after having been homeless and in pain and suffering for years. Went to my mother's house. Now, going to my mother's house was quite an interesting thing. Now, you have to understand, my mother, having come from a family of very Catholic people, my mother was Italian, but she also has some French, French-Canadian. My mother's father was French-Canadian. We are a very Catholic family, both sides. And in my mother's little house, little house I grew up in, there, it was like a religious goods store. There were more crucifixes, statues of the Blessed Mother, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, Bibles, rosaries. My mother went and got holy water by the five-gallon jug. <laughs> now, that's where I went, and I was a mess when I, I went there. I could imagine the devil would have taken... He took a horrible beating in that house. <laughs> now, he come in there to try to torment me, but I'll tell you what, he got the snot beat out of him in that house. <laughs> Man, there was holy water everywhere. And, and I, I didn't understand. And then, my, my, you know, when I first went home, my mother was always going through the, through the house, <laughs> mumbling prayers that I should probably do in exorcism prayers or something. <laughs> I started to read the Bible. I started to say the rosary. Went to confession at Orysville. Seven years later, I was ordained by the Pope. Three years later... My dad came to hear me preach. My dad, who has a very important part in my ministry. One day my dad said, I wish I could have been a better father. God heard the prayer. My father's had three open heart surgeries. He was a tough guy. My father was a typical macho Italian tough guy athlete, great athlete, boxer, played all sports. He also played the horses <laughs> too much, drank. You know, he's a wild guy. Not good. And he said to me, I wish I could have been a better father. God heard the prayer. He's had 37 surgeries. The man has been in pain nonstop for years. He helps breathe power into my ministry and my mother, too, in her way. Mercy. Do you understand that God's mercy is infinite and that you and I are called to be fountains, conduits, and dispensers of mercy? Well, my dad came to hear me preach. And at the end, when he had to leave, he said, you got a minute for me? I said, well, sure, Dad, because you know when I'm ministering, I'm really besieged. I don't have a minute for hardly anything. And I said, well, sure, Dad. And he said, you know what? He says, I'd like to go to confession. And I heard these words come out of my father's mouth. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's 50 years since my last confession. He made a beautiful confession. He went on to do his part. I went on to do my part. And my part concerns mercy. And your part concerns mercy. This land, as we're preparing for the coming, or rather for the resurrection of the Lord, for his passion, death, and resurrection, during Lent, as we're preparing, concentrate on mercy. And that means be merciful. Be merciful. Be merciful to that relative you just can't stand. Be merciful to your children who seem to be going the wrong way. That doesn't mean you have to accept sin. You don't have to accept evil. Be kind, gentle, and be merciful. How often, when Peter asked Jesus, how often must I forgive those who sin against me? Seven times, Lord. Oh, no, I tell you not seven times. Seventy times seven. That means an infinite number. Now, God practices what he preaches. As often as we go to him, repentant, he will forgive us. What about us? 
Are we the same way? Or do we get sick and tired of certain people, certain classes of people? My dear friends, mercy. Be merciful as God is merciful to us. And remember, please remember, God's mercy is for everyone. God's mercy is infinite. And God's mercy endures forever. God bless you. Together as God's family, let us pray in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is now. Give us this day our daily and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive our trespasses against us, and let us O Mary, conceived without sin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. After Jesus was baptized by St. John the Baptist, and we understand that to mean Jesus, when he went into the waters of the Jordan, baptized the waters, giving those waters power ultimately to baptize us. Of course, Jesus had no sin. You understand that Jesus, a divine person, second person of the Blessed Trinity, assumed a human nature and became like one of us in everything except sin. No sin in the Lord. Now, I'm going to read to you from the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. It's a, a reading that's very appropriate for Lent. We're coming into Lent next week. After Jesus was baptized at the Jordan, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit. Now, I'm just going to make a footnote here. Lousy translation. Jesus wasn't led by the Spirit. Jesus was driven by force, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Ekbalain, a Greek verb. You pick up a football or a baseball, and you hurl it with all your might. That's the meaning of that verb. He was hurled by force. Not against his will, nothing like that. But the power of the Holy Spirit didn't lead him. <laughs> Drove him. It's like, I didn't feel like getting up this morning and coming to preach. I wasn't led by the Spirit <laughs> to do my job this morning. He drove me. Now, I don't mind that. It's good. Some of us need to be driven. You know, I might not have moved. Well, not with Jesus. No deficiencies in Jesus. No weaknesses in Jesus. But the word in the scripture, he was driven by the power of the Spirit into the desert for 40 days tempted by the devil. You remember that movie, that stupid movie, Last Temptation of Christ? I don't know who they had for a theological advisor on that thing. And don't get me started on that. But in any event, it, it, it portrayed a silly thing. Now, it says that the devil tempted Jesus for 40 days in the desert. That's correct. Hey, the Word of God says it. That's true. The devil did tempt him. Could Jesus fall into temptation? Certainly not. Certainly not. A divine person, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, 
Now, who falls into temptation? Persons or natures? Persons. The subject of action. Could Jesus fall into temptation? No. Could he be tempted? Yes. Why did he do it at all? Give us an example. Now, he has a human nature. That divine person acting through his human nature. It's called a theandric action. Two more Greek words. Don't, don't worry about big fancy words. Just know what they mean. Theandric action, an action of the God-man. Two Greek words that mean God and man. So it's an action of the God-man. Jesus, a divine person acting through his human nature. So the devil tempted him. For Forty days, absolutely, the devil did tempt him. But could Jesus give in to temptation? No. Absolutely not. Bad theology to say that he could. I'll ask you a question along those lines. The blessed in heaven, do they have a free will? Certainly they do. Can they sin? No, they cannot. Well, how can they be free and not sin? Because their freedom has been indeed set free. They are confirmed in grace. Well, Jesus is beyond being merely confirmed in grace. He has the grace of the hypostatic union. That's the union of the God-man, divinity and humanity, acting form. So he, he could be tempted, but he can't sin. There's a difference. A lot of people struggle with that, and they try to say, oh, well, what good is it then? You know, then he's not like me. He is like you and me in everything except sin. He became like one of us in everything except sin. He did not sin, and he could not sin. Well, then he's not free. Yes, he's consummately free. His freedom is confirmed and absolute. It's the freedom that we will have in, a, in an analogous manner of speaking in heaven. Okay, so tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing in those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. That's the humanity part. He had a human nature. He could be hungry. He could suffer cold and heat. That's true. That's not a moral defect. That's a physical defect. Jesus had no moral defects. He had the physical limitations of humanity, but he didn't have moral limitations. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God... Command this stone to become bread. Now, let, let me, I'm going through this slowly. Now, who said that? The devil said that. Now, you remember the little story I told you this morning about the, that guy who said, uh, we don't b really believe in angels and demons. They're just literary devices used in sacred scripture to make a point. That's hogwash. Let me use that highly theological term. <laughs> Hogwash. There are angels and there are demons. Now, in the beginning, God created everything out of nothing. Ex nihilo, as we say in Latin. That's what creation means. The creator, and there's only one of them, God. The creator brought everything that is into being out of nothing. That's creation by definition, okay? And it was all good. Everything God creates is good. It has to be. It comes from his creating hand. It has to be good. The angel's good. Oh, what about the devil? Is he good? That's how he started out. Good. An angel. Then what happened? Well, you can read about it in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It comes down to us, to the tradition given to us by the doctors, fathers, and saints of the church. A plan was revealed by God to the angels. Well, it was the plan of the incarnation and redemption. Now, Lucifer, one of the brightest of the angels, an angel now, good, pure spiritual essence, angel denotes their mission, not their being, messengers. Angels are messengers. That very high angel, very intelligent, very bright, the word Lucifer, his name Lucifer, means light of the morning or morning star. That concerns brightness. That's analogous to light, which has to do with the intellect, which has to do with truth, 
which in philosophy we say is a convertible term with goodness and being itself. Very high angel, very bright, intelligent, beautiful, good. Now Lucifer, blinded by his own light, chose darkness, rebelled at the plan of God. And the plan of God was that God would assume a created nature. God would assume a created nature. And that nature would be human. In other words, the Word would become flesh and dwell among us. And Lucifer said, no, arrogant, no, bad plan, God, I've got a better one. You take my nature. If God's going to assume a created nature, it'll be mine, angelic. I'm the highest, the most beautiful, the best. Non serviat. I will not serve. Now, if you're smart, you can see there, you can discern the prototype of all sin. Hubris, pride, arrogance, self-centered pride. Hey, I'm the best. Don't you know? I'm the best preacher there. Are you? Hey, take mine. Or else... I'm not going to serve you. And so, as Jesus would later say, I watched Satan and a third of the angels fall from heaven. Now, I don't have much time any place I go. I don't debate with anyone. I don't argue I don't enter into polemics. I'm just not involved with any of that. What I teach is what the Catholic Church teaches. And that is very clear. That is very objective. And that I know up one side and down the other. And I tell you, angels and demons are real, not a mere literary device as some who have been educated into imbecility would have you believe. Satan is real, a fallen angel, and he has many helpers, likewise fallen angels. There is a war going on between good and evil, between truth and lies, a life and death struggle, the war to end all wars. Without any question, no. There are many so-called intelligent, educated, they're not intelligent, but they're educated in quotation marks, who would have you believe this is pious fiction, medieval nonsense. They are dead wrong. And metaphorically speaking, should be lined up against a wall and shot for treason. In plain English, because that is false. The devil's real. Fallen angels are real. There are many lies about. Bite into them, as our first parents bit into the, the apple from that forbidden tree, and you'll suffer the consequences. Remember what God said in the garden? You can partake of all the trees in the garden. Human freedom is very broad. But you cannot partake of the tree in the center of the garden or even touch it lest you die. Human freedom has limits, and the limits are laid down by God. So, the truth is not something we make up as we go along. The truth is something which we receive with fidelity. It is something which we hand on with fidelity. It is not something we make up as we go along. So, the devil, now, and when, when you see that, the devil, make sure that you understand this isn't merely a principle of evil. This is a real spiritual being, perverse and perverting, as the Holy Father has taught in some of his documents. You know how important this is? This is so important that the Pope spent several Wednesday audiences teaching on this. He taught in depth on this. This is part of the sacred deposit of the doctrine of the faith that I'm giving you here. 
If you believe it, you believe what the church believes. If you don't, you're a heretic. In plain English. And you separate yourself from the body of Christ. It's that simple. Don't do that. Now, most simple people don't do that. It is the pseudo-educated who do that. They are deceived and go about deceiving others. They are blind and leading the blind. I was interested to see that that's in the mass readings for today. The Holy Spirit always provides grist for my mill. In any event, the devil, a fallen angel, Lucifer, Satan, tempted Jesus for those 40 days in the desert. And he said, well, he was hungry. He said, well, here, have some, turn, turn, take these stones and turn them into bread. You know, the devil had an intimation, this was the son of God here. He didn't know that absolutely. You know, Satan is not God. Only God knows all things. The devil doesn't know all things. But he is very intelligent, very clever being. He can make clever deductions, very astute. He can't predict the future. Only God knows the future. But through the clever use of things in nature, it looks like he, he knows. Uh, I can tell you that some of us who have had vocations to be religious or priests, some of us who are called to serve could tell you in all honesty that we've been persecuted from infancy in a certain way by the devil. And I can tell you without any question, he had me marked from the beginning. He tortured me from the beginning. He knew something. He didn't know it absolutely, but he's a real good estimator. Jesus said, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone. The word of God is powerful against evil. You know, you good people are the pillars of the church. You're the best we have. And as such, you owe it to yourself and to others to be filled with the word of God, rich as it is. You should be reading the Bible every day. You should be reading and studying the Catechism of the Catholic Church in conjunction with the Bible. You should be fed by the Word of God. You should be strengthened by it, healed by it, protected by it. It's powerful in this spiritual combat that we're engaged in. And so Jesus responded to the tempter with the Word of God. Now, you know, temptation is something that you've got to know about. Now, I know you know about temptation. Everybody's tempted in one way or another. I, I could title this talk, From Temptation to Sanctity. Temptation in itself is a neutral thing. It is neither good nor evil. Temptation can be used for good. What do I mean by that? Well, very simply, let's say you're tempted to some sin. Everybody has a weakness. Now, some people have weaknesses in the areas of sexuality. Some people have weaknesses in oh, substance abuse, stealing, all kind of weaknesses, right? All kinds of sins. Now, the devil knows you. He knows you well. He knows your weak areas. He knows what to shoot at. And he's a very good shot. You owe it to yourself to be aware of these things. I'm going to tell you something. Like my professor, Father Rudolph, in the seminary used to say, Father Rudolph Ranaschek was from the, at that time, the country of Yugoslavia. He had been a theology professor at the University of Zagreb. And he taught in the seminary, and he was, you know, one of those old-fashioned guys. He was one of those crusty old priest who was down to earth, rough, but he was a good man. He wanted what was best for us. He would get up in the pulpit when it was his turn to preach and he'd glare out at us. And he would say, you know, I have a soul to save too, and I'm not going to lose it for any of you guys. 
and then he would let us have them. He was a, he was a professor of moral theology, and a good one. In other words, folks, I'm not going to hell for any of you. I love you, but I ain't going to hell for you. You know how priests go to hell? Not always for what they do, but for what we fail to do. It can be uncomfortable. Now, through a special grace, it's not uncomfortable for me because I rather enjoy it. <laughs> but I can see how it could be uncomfortable for some to say things that people don't like to hear. You know, nobody likes to, to, to hear morally uncomfortable things. You know, we don't preach on a lot of stuff. Because we don't want to make people uncomfortable because we got uncomfortable. Hey, you know, the people get uncomfortable. I could never be a parish priest. I think they are great heroes. But I, I, I could, God doesn't trust me enough to ever make me a parish priest. Just that he doesn't trust me enough to let me be a parent. You know, that's why he called me to what he called me to. I come in, do my thing and get out. Because it's hard to hit a moving target. <laughs> the poor parish priest has to stay there day in and day out, week in after week, month after month. Yeah, I, I come in, rile things up, and then he's got to deal with it the rest of the time. Well, that, that's a very traditional thing in the church. Mission preachers have always done that. Nothing new about that. But, you know, in the little time that I have been in parish, there's only really one parish I ever spend any time in, my own home parish where I grew up. I'd work there summers in between semesters at university. And, oh, I galled the people no end. Some, they just couldn't stand me. Because I talked about stuff most people won't talk about. You know, it's always struck me as logical, and it's also biblical, that we need to address problematic things. If you go to the doctor, and you have a cancerous tumor on your liver, and the doctor examines you, he knows the tumor's there, but he says, my, what bright eyes you have. Your feet are in great shape. You have nice, shiny hair. Well, he says that to some. <laughs> you wouldn't think much of that, doctor. Hey, my liver's sick. Or my heart. Or whatever it is. A doctor addresses the parts that are ill, that are sick, that need healing. If I say, oh, you're okay, I'm okay, how wonderful you are, am I doing you any favor? No, I'm, I might be confirming you in your sins. And that is neither pastoral, merciful, nor charitable. That is indifferent at best, cowardly at worst. Not good. If you've got a moral problem, someone should tell you about it, at least in general, you know. Oh, but I don't see anything wrong with abortion under certain circumstances. Shouldn't a woman have a right to choose? You know, in all of language, we usually finish the sentence, except in that case. Right to choose what? Do we have a right to choose? Choose what? Certainly. Should we have a right to choose from among innumerable goods? Certainly. You have the right to choose to go to a basketball game this afternoon or to come here. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just a legitimate choice. You have a legitimate choice whether you drive a Ford or a Toyota. You have that choice. Do you have the right to choose evil? No, you do not. Does anyone have the moral right to do wrong? No. Physically, I can climb up on top of the church, jump off and kill myself. Do I have the ability to do that? Yes. Do I have the moral right or ability to do that? No. Do I have free will? Yes. Good, evil. I could choose good or evil, correct? Yes. What's the moral choice? Only one, good. Does anyone have a right to choose evil? No. And the logic is very simple. Yes, but if it's good for me, you know, you don't have to do it. All right, fine. 
I'm looking out here and somebody scowling at me, doesn't like what I have to say. I reach under here, take out my 45, and I'm a good shot, and I blast them. Don't I have a right to choose what I want to do? After all, it is a free country, and you say absurd. Of course not. You can't do that. You see, we have a right to choose from a, among goods. We have freedom, but don't confuse it with license. Freedom, yes. License, no. And so Jesus was tempted. The Lord responded. The word of God. Man doesn't live by bread alone. And then the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and glory, for it has been delivered over to me, and I can give it to whomever I will. And I wonder if for once the father of lies was telling the truth. All these kingdoms, all creation, all the political power. I control it all. I'm the prince of this world. And I can give that to you. If only you will worship me. I wonder how many times in various ways that temptation has come to all of us. Let me tell you how it comes to me. In a very short time, I gained notoriety in what I do. Not because I wanted it or I was clever in doing it. It just happened through the power of God. I never tried to make it happen. I certainly never told anybody what they wanted to hear in order to make it happen. And basically, day by day and moment by moment, I risk what I do by doing what I do. But if God is for you, who can be against you? Now, one time I I was preaching in Florida in the early days. I was only ordained about a year or two. And I was preaching in true Baptist style. And afterwards, an elderly Monsignor came up to me and he says, Young man, young man, you can't speak that way. That's inflammatory. And I said, Oh, Monsignor, you better believe that's inflammatory. Jesus said, I come to cast fire on the earth. And oh, how I long that it already be ignited. But what he was saying is, hey, we Catholic priests can't talk like that. Protestants might talk like that, but you can't talk like that. That's too strong. That rocks the boat. That'll make people angry. You'll lose your position. You won't have a very long career. Make my day. I can go fishing more then. <laughs> the devil holds that out to us. You see, the way it is now, I've achieved, for whatever reason, a certain following. I hate that word. But in any event, I receive over 500 invitations to preach every year. I take 30 to 35. That means I turn down how many? 15, 17 for every one I take. I can pick and choose. I can go wherever I want. And I usually can name the terms. And the devil comes to me this way. If only you'll tone it down a little bit. If only you'll watch what you say. If only you wouldn't talk about abortion. Or artificial contraception. If only you would leave those controversial things out why I would spread your fame from one end of the world to the other now of course the devil never comes as the devil he comes as an angel of light it would be prudent for you to do that Father John this is God speaking <laughs> says the liar and it would be very prudent for you to be careful 
You know, be wise. Be tempered in your speech. Be like others. Don't rock the boat. Don't challenge people so much you make them uncomfortable. And if only you can learn how to do that. I, I, one time a bishop said, and he was a good bishop. I mean, I love this bishop. A very fine man. And he said to me when he first met me, I was working for him at the time. He said, now, John, I want you to be smooth. Exact word. That's a quote. Now, John, I want you to be smooth so that you might gain a constituency. Bishop. Me? Smooth? Constituency? That sounds like politics, doesn't it? Constituency, to be smooth, diplomatic. Nothing wrong with diplomacy. I'm not really a diplomat. It's good to be a diplomat. Holy Father's a diplomat. It's good. But I'm more blunt. You know, the body of Christ has many members. We're not all the same. Many people have gifts I could never have. I respect those gifts. I can't do certain things. I can tell you my mail is delivered to me in bags, sacks. Thousands and thousands of letters. If I responded to it all personally, or answered phone calls, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, honestly, all of it's good. One out of maybe five or ten thousand pieces of correspondence might be negative. And I mean that honestly, literally. That doesn't mean that there aren't people who don't like it. There are plenty of them. But of the response that I get, it is overwhelmingly positive. How many priests get that kind of response? Very few. And I'm not saying I'm any better than them. I'm not. I'm worse. But if a moron like me can do this, then so can anybody. Let me tell you something. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a jackass and continues to do so. <laughs> Very simple. Very simple. That's the way it is. And so, by telling the truth, by being straightforward, I don't mean to offend anybody. Actually, I'm more sensitive than the average guy. I, I'm not trying to offend anybody. I would wish never to offend anybody, honestly. You know, I talk a tough story, but no, the fact of the matter is I don't want to offend anybody. But I am not averse to offending someone if I have to in doing the job, in performing the mission. You're not going to be able to say when you stand before God, well, I didn't know. Not my fault. I'm telling you. I'm telling you the things that really matter. The devil will hold out to you the temptation of worldly goods. I am meeting with an increasing number of Catholic physicians, various places I go. They've had it up to here with the garbage in their profession, and they're banding together. They're not going to perform abortions, and they're not even going to pre prescribe birth control pills, a lot of them. In medical school, they're being coerced into doing these things and systematically rooted out if it is discovered that they are, in fact, Catholic. And what I mean by that is living their faith, putting it in action. The procedures now, I can't even talk about it. It's so distasteful. But some of the things that are going on are truly horrid. And so you have a groundswell among physicians, Catholic lawyers, in every sphere of human activity. Listen, you don't just go to church on Sunday and live like hell on Monday. Hmm? Put your Catholic hat on on Sunday and go out and be just like the rest of the world the other six days. You can't do it. But it's comfortable to do it, isn't it? And I don't mean you have to go preach a sermon in your workplace or your school. I don't mean that. But I do mean that you have to be rock solid in your faith and you have to have a backbone. No backbone you won't stand. 
You won't stand for anything and you'll fall for everything. That's what happened. The reason the world is in a mess is because we're in a mess. The reason that the good lay faithful are in a mess is because we priests are a mess. We've lost our backbone. No more guts. The manliness has gone out of it in a false, effeminate spirit. Sometimes even physical, if not emotional and spiritual, has replaced it. And we've gotten weak in the knees. And we are averse to preaching the truth in season and out of season, convenient or inconvenient, accepted or rejected. It is what it is. I hope you accept it. But if you don't, it's not going to change me one bit. The message is the same. We have to hand that message on faithfully. Salvation of our souls depends upon it. The salvation of our country depends upon it. Salvation of the world depends upon it. As we have de-Christianized society, we have dehumanized society. This used to be a very Christian country. I grew up in a very Christian country. It was formed by Christian ideals, morals. That is not true anymore. If you don't believe it, you just think for a moment on what used to be on television compared to what is on television. You think about the crime rate then compared to now. When I was a boy, the prisons weren't full of people who were involved with drugs. Their drugs existed, illegal drugs, but it wasn't common. Now it's totally common and something like 80 to 90 percent of all criminals are in jail because of drug-related things. It's the devil's work. And I mean that literally, not figuratively. How did it happen? Because we Catholics sat back and let it happen. We're just like the rest of the neo-pagan world. We weren't strong enough in our faith to resist. How could an atrocity like abortion be the law of this great land? How is that possible with over 60 million Catholics and many other millions of good Christians in this country? How can such an atrocity such an outrage against humanity, such a holocaust. How could that be given the noble term law? Because too many of us are asleep or dead in our faith. It went from bad to worse. We had a presidential election not too long ago. Now, I don't get involved in politics, but you can't separate religion from politics. You really can't. You can in a certain way, but listen, if you're Catholic, that means you form a Catholic conscience and you vote a Catholic conscience. I would never tell you who to vote for. You can't do that. However, <laughs> a lot of you didn't vote for the, uh, the right guy, and a lot of you did vote for the right guy. You know, maybe half and half. You know who elected Clinton the second time? Catholics. You know that? Yeah, Catholics re-elected Bill Clinton right after he refused to repeal partial birth abortion. And Bob Schieffer, the news commentator, when the election returns were coming in, was marveling at it. He said it right on television. I can't believe it. Catholics are re-electing Bill Clinton, who just refused to repeal partial birth abortion. Bob Schieffer said that. And he wasn't making religious commentary. So we had this election, and, and the country it was unheard of. We, we were, in a sense, traumatized by the whole thing. We couldn't elect the president, and there was rhetoric back and forth on both sides, anger, bitterness. And we could see how polaroid, polarized the country was, and it went on day after day after day. And then a certain woman from humble background, a Mexican woman, said to her husband, why don't we make a pilgrimage down to Mexico, or my country, down to the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe and pray for our country and pray 
for this presidential election. And so they went, and they prayed. And the man consecrated the presidency of the one who would win to Our Lady of Guadalupe. The man's name is Jeb Bush, the brother of the president. On December 12th, the Supreme Court decision came down. I know that because the rector of the cathedral, where Jeb Bush is a parishioner, is one of my best priest friends. When it looked hopeless, hang in there. When the devil tempts you with all the kingdoms of the world, remember that there's only one kingdom that matters. The kingdom of heaven, and when it looks like you might lose all your worldly riches because you won't go along with the program, because you won't go with the flow, remember that dead bodies float downstream. It takes live bodies, live minds, live souls to resist the immoral currents of the times. Stand fast in your faith. Jesus responded to the temptation, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. Again, he responds with the word of God. And then the devil took him to Jerusalem, and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will give his angels charge of you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. Presumption. And Jesus responded to it, It is said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Three temptations. In these three temptations can be synthesized all temptation. Every one of us is tempted throughout the course of our life. The temptations take various forms, come in various ways. They come through people, places, and things. The Word of God, rich as it is, powerful as it is, is always the response. Know it. Don't be presumptuous. Presumption is a sin against the Holy Spirit. There are two terrible sins against the Holy Spirit. Presumption and despair. I could say that we live today in our society between those radical poles of presumption and despair. They are sins against the Holy Spirit. They are sins against faith. They are sins indeed. Presumption is that sin where we imagine that we can be saved without grace or effort. Oh, God is good. True statement. Oh, well, God is merciful. True statement. God understands. You better believe he does. God loves you right where you're at. Absolutely certain he does. But if where you're at is sin, God doesn't love the sin that's eating you alive. Does God love you? Yes. Does God love the worst sinner in the world? Oh, yes. He died. Well, let me give you an analogy to help you understand it. If you are my beloved brother or sister, <clears throat> and you are, and God forbid you should contract cancer, would I stop loving you as a result of that? Certainly not. If I loved you in the first place, I would not cease loving you because of that disease. Perhaps I would love you even more. If I had the heart and mind of Christ, I would desire to alleviate your suffering. Maybe I would even somehow take it upon myself to spare you that pain. Sin is moral cancer. And it eats us alive. God doesn't stop loving the sinner. God loves the sinner. But he doesn't love the sin that's eating him away. And we have to be the same. Love the sinner. Don't, no, you can't 
hate the sinner. You've got to love every sinner because we're in the number. Love the sinner, hate the sin, the old saying. All right? Now, these temptations are an illustration. Jesus permitted the devil to tempt him, and he responded, giving us an example, showing us what to do. We are going to have a million and one temptations. Sometimes the greatest souls come out of the greatest temptation. Now, I want you to take a look at the best friends of Jesus. Now, we think about the Gospels. That's how this is revealed to us. You look at the Gospel. Let me tell you who I believe the best friends of Christ were. Well, we've got Mary Magdalene. Who did the risen Christ appear to first, according to Scripture? Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was a prostitute out of whom was cast seven demons. Jesus delivered her from the power of Satan. She was the first one to see the risen Christ. She was a dear friend of the Lord Jesus Christ. She who had sinned much, had the capacity to love much. The passion that drove her the wrong way, when transformed and purified by the grace of God, that same passion drove her Drove her like the Spirit drove Jesus into the desert. Drove her the right way. Drove her to pray and do penance for all the rest of her life in the desert. One of the first of the anchoresses or hermits. And then what about Peter? Peter was one of the best friends of Jesus, right? First Pope. Peter. Insights into St. Peter. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he took out his sword and he cut off the high priest's servant's ear. My kind of God. <laughs> well, no, not that that's so good. He, he was... Well, maybe it's good. No, he, he was a passionate man. He wanted to defend the Lord. Sure, he was a, he was human, he was weak, he was sinful. Hey, what did he do? He denied Christ three times. Right? Just like Jesus predicted he would. He, he didn't. Oh, I don't know the man. Don't know him at all. But then he went out and wept bitterly. Peter was one of the best friends of Christ. A passionate man, a sinful man. What about James and John? They were the other two best friends of Jesus. Remember what happened when they were going through Samaritan territory and they wanted hospitality from the Samaritans and they wouldn't give it to them? Samaritans wouldn't give a Jew hospitality. They were kind of enemies in religion. And what did James and John say? Well, Lord, let's call down lightning and wipe them out. He called in their strike. Wow, send some napalm down, Lord. We'll wipe that rotten Samaritan village out. They won't give us hospitality. Well, give them what fur. And Jesus called them Bonarges, sons of thunder. You see? Mary Magdalene, Peter, James, and John. Really the closest friends of Jesus, as far as we can tell. From the gospel. Passionate people sinful people, people who went the wrong way for a while, but people who were drawn to Christ. He didn't reject them. He loved them. He didn't say, oh, you're a terrible sinner. You're not good enough to be in my company. No, he welcomed them with open arms. Jesus, the divine physician, said, it's a sick man who requires a physician, not a well man. I have come for sinners, not for the self-righteous, the Lord says. And that's good news for us, because to one degree or another, we're all sinners. And so then the devil defeated, left him. It says, the devil departed from him until an opportune time. 
until an opportune time. Now there's the story of our life. You fight it out, you overcome temptation, and the devil will depart until an opportune time. In other words, he'll come back and try again. All my life, from my teens until I was 37 years old, say 20 years, from 17 to 37, I was plagued by many of the same demons that plague our society today. Lust, substance abuse, whether alcohol or drugs, lust for power. You know, you want to be looked up to, you want to be in the driver's seat, you want to be able to tell people what to do. You know, the soap opera of politics, especially the unhappy spectacle that we're seeing of the last presidency. And I do not condemn poor Clinton. I, I don't normally don't mention names, but you know who I'm talking about anyway, so. But I, I, I don't. I'm not down on him. I don't hate him. I, you know, in him I see so much of our society. It, it, he's like the personification. It's a monster we've created. Clinton's no different than a million other people, maybe me. But it's a sorry testimony to what's happened to our great country. But it can become great again, and it will become great again if enough of us will pray. And if enough of us will resist the temptation, temptation of what? Hey, temptation to cheat on anything. Temptation to, oh, just throw in the towel and give up, you know. Oh, the stress is getting to me. I can't take this. These people are rotten. Why bother? The harder I try, the worse it gets. Let me get drunk. Really? And then what happens? It gets worse than it was in the beginning. You get depressed. And the depression on top of the problem you already had is magnified. And you know what the end of it all is? Do you know why the devil is behind that? He wants you dead. Even physically, but especially morally. How many times I've come close to death, I can't count them. How many times I could have ended up dead in a drug house or in prison or in some God-forsaken gutter? can't hardly believe it. When I look back on it, I, the first time I did my personal testimony in, in Florida, an old Monsignor came up to me shaking and said, and said oh, oh, young man, young man, that's an amazing story. But is it true? <laughs> and I said, Monsignor, if it hadn't happened to me, I'd have a hard time believing it, too. But it's absolutely true. I marvel at it. You know, I, I, the great statesman Conrad Adenauer said, God has placed obvious limitations on our intelligence, but none whatsoever on our stupidity. <laughs> I'm living proof of that pithy saying. And I marvel at it. How did I do that? Why would I ever do that? And you know what? It ain't over till it's over. Hey, right, I had a conversion, right? Came back to the church was ordained a priest even by the Pope. Wow. And then went on to preach. I preached to other people. I live in fear. Just like St. Paul. I fear that having preached to others, I myself might be lost. Why? Because I have not arrived yet. I have not arrived. You know when you arrive? When you get in heaven. Anything can happen until then. And so what we need to do is remain humble. Remain humble. Work out our salvation. Trust God. Be confident in His goodness. But hey, you know what? If left up to me, I will dive head first into hell. No question about it. It's only the mercy of God, the providence of our Lord and our Blessed Mother's care, the angels, 
We have great help in the angels. I talk about the devils, I'll tell you what. Angels. Good angels. Every one of us have one. Do you know that? You have an angel, a guardian angel. That's not some mere myth, you know. That's church teaching. That's church teaching. Every one of us has a guardian angel. Remember the movie Star Wars, R2-D2? And the little robots? And those robots, boy, they were really smart, and they could run the spaceship and all kind of stuff. Well, we got something way better than that. We each have a guardian angel. And that guardian angel was assigned to us. And from the moment of conception, all the way through our life, what's his job? Well, guard, yes, to guard us, but to get us to heaven. Mine, should he ever accomplish the mission, will be the most highly decorated angel <laughs> in the history of heaven. God will give him all the medals, sign over half the kingdom to him probably. He said, wow, you put up with that. But that's what the angels do. St. Michael, the very word, Michael in Hebrew. And he's the, he's the, the angel, the power of God. He's the protector of God's people. He's the kind of military one. He's the one who combats the devil. Head to head. St. Michael. I tell you, St. Michael literally has saved me on more than one occasion. Literally. Saved my life. St. Gabriel, the angel of the incarnation, the one who came to comfort our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. St. Raphael, the healing power of God. Remember from the book of Tobit, how he went to battle with the evil spirit, and won the battle, protecting his charge. Have devotion for the angels. We have feast day for them, you know. We have a feast day for the holy angels, uh, for Michael, Gabriel, for the archangels, Rachel, and also for the guardian angels. We've got two feast days in our, at the end of September, right? September 29th. And then the guardian angels, I believe it's October 2nd. And so... Do you talk to your guardian angel? You should. You ask him for things, you ask him to help you, you ask him to help your children, your grandchildren, do it. We've got a powerful helper, do that. Now, you know, I know that in a lot of circles, I would be considered silly uh, to talk about such things. <clears throat> I understand that. I, I accept that. One time when I finished my doctorate degree in theology, uh, someone who was somewhat educated, came up to me and said, Father, at what level do you teach? Assuming that I, I taught doctoral candidates or seminarians or university, whatever, graduate school. And I said, well, I teach kindergarten. <laughs> he said, but you have five university degrees. You graduated top honors and everything. And, you know, surely you have a position in a major university. Nope. I teach kindergarten. And as one rather well-known liberal theologian had it after reviewing my course on the Catechism of the Catholic Church, he concluded, this man is a simpleton. And I took it as a compliment. Because if you know theology, you know that God by definition is pure simplicity. Perhaps a simpleton is one who follows the simple God. I don't know, but I know this. Our business is to teach the simple truth simply. Our business is to not take the simple truth and render it incomprehensible. The great Archbishop Fulton Sheen used to say, sometimes we educators, theologians, philosophers, teachers, we think that our business is to take a simple thing and, and render it nearly unintelligible so that people will say, wow, how smart he is. If he understands that, he must be smart. <laughs> Bishop Sheen gave a lecture in England one time to a class of deacons uh, on theandric actions, that word I said before, the action of the God-man, Jesus Christ. And Bishop Sheen, of course, was a very erudite man, and he was a wonderful orator, tremendous, also a great holy man whose cause for canonization has been introduced. But Bishop Sheen held forth, and one of the British deacons came up to him after, and he said, Ah, oh, Dr. Sheen, positively brilliant, Positively brilliant. 
Bishop Sheen said, oh, really, what did I say? And he said, well, I don't quite know. And Bishop Sheen said, neither do I. And he made a vow then that he would never try to take a simple thing and render it complicated. And we shouldn't do that either. Parents, teachers, religious sisters, priests, we should all take the simple faith, the simple truth, and teach it simply. And that way, among other ways, we will be doing battle with the enemy of souls. Yes, we'll be tempted in many different ways at many different times. But if we stay firmly rooted in Christ, the Word of God, we'll be able to deal with all that temptation, and that temptation will become a vehicle that propels us into sanctity, that propels us into heaven. God bless you. God's plan, man's opportunity, Satan's attack. What is God's plan? We have to think about that because it's very important. What is God's plan in general? What is God's plan for you, personally, individually? The answer to that question certainly is important. It is essential. It is a literal matter of life or death. I've said it before many times, and I expect to say it even more times before I die. When it's all over, you and I are going to be one or two things. And please don't forget it. Winner, loser. Heaven, hell. Period. That's it. Everybody who goes to purgatory goes to heaven, of course. And so in the end, there are only two things we can possibly be. A winner or a loser. And that means heaven or hell. Two ways are set before you, O man. The way of life and the way of death. Therefore, choose life. Choose the truth rather than a lie. Choose good rather than evil. Choose God rather than Satan. Choose heaven rather than hell. In order to understand things, to gain insight, it's always good to go back to the beginning. As St. Thomas Aquinas often said, an error in the beginning is an error indeed. You don't want to make an error in the beginning at the level of principles, at the level of origins, causes. An error in the beginning is an error indeed. So we go back to the beginning, creation. First and second chapters of the book of Genesis, God creates everything out of nothing. That is what creation is by definition, and only God can do it. Only the uncreated, only the creator, God, can do that. And so he brings everything into being out of nothing. Ex nihilo. The end of the line, man. God pronounces it to be good, very good. Everything that God creates is good because it comes from the one who is goodness itself. So it has to be good. That's Genesis 1 and 2. Now Genesis 3, something goes wrong. The serpent approaches Eve. God said, you can't eat of the trees in the garden. No, Eve said, we, we can partake of the trees in the garden, but not the one in the center of the garden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We cannot partake of it or even touch it lest we die. And the serpent 
the devil, Satan, the one Jesus would call a liar and the father of lies a murderer from the beginning, says, ah, surely you do not believe God. No, God just doesn't want you to be like him. Go ahead, try it. You'll like it. Go ahead, disobey God. He's lying to you, says the father of lies, because surely you will not die because if you partake of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you yourselves will become like gods, knowing good and evil. Knowing good and evil for yourselves, subjectively and arbitrarily, without reference to the only one who determines what is good and what is evil for his creation. God alone knows what's good for us and what's not good for us. The fall. We know that Eve bought into the big lie that we could become like gods. That really was a replaying of an earlier sin. That's the original sin, a doctrine of the faith. But what happened, the tradition of the church has come down to us through many of the fathers. The angels were given a test. Now you can find this in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the essential parts of it. The angels had a test. Now, we don't know for certain exactly how that went, but many of the fathers said that test concerned God's plan in the first part of the talk. God's plan. What is God's plan? God's plan for the incarnation and for redemption. The Word, the eternal Word, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the only Word our Heavenly Father ever spoke in the eternal silences of the Trinity. His only word. He has no more to say. For in that one word he has said everything in Jesus. And so that plan of God was revealed to the angels. They had a test that God, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, would assume a human nature and become like one of us in everything except sin. That the word would become flesh and dwell among us. That's God's plan. Lucifer, the brightest of the angels, the very name means light of the morning, morning star. Now light has to do with intelligence. Intelligence is good. And that which is true and good is beautiful. And so Lucifer, one of the brightest of the angels, one of the most intelligent, one of the best, one of the brightest, one of the most beautiful, Lucifer, upon hearing this, blinded by his own life, pride, chose darkness. Non serviat. I shall not serve. In other words, no, God, I don't like your plan. I do not accept that plan. I don't want to do it your way. I have a better way. If you're going to assume a nature, a created nature, why not mine? It's certainly more intelligent, better, brighter, more beautiful. No, if God's going to assume a created nature, you take mine. No, I won't accept God's plan. Arrogance, hubris, that kind of unholy pride that imagines that we are the source of our own glory. That was Lucifer's sin. That is the fall of the angels. Jesus would say later that he saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Book of Revelation, he took a third of the stars of heaven with him. The fall of the angels. How did it happen? God's plan is announced. Lucifer rejects God's plan. Why? Pride. Pride is the genesis of all sin. 
please, please learn this principle and then spend the rest of your life fighting it out in order to live it. Pride results in disobedience. You have to be humble to obey. First comes pride. I can be like God. I do not accept God's plan. I have a plan. That pride, that arrogance, then leads to disobedience. No, Servia. No. Lucifer says, no, I'm not going to do that. Then what happens? Just what God said would happen. Death. Pride, disobedience, death enters creation. Oh, we have physical death, yes. But there is a moral death as well, the death of the life of grace in the soul. We know mortal sin causes that. Pride, disobedience, death, and the worst death of all, the second death that the book of Revelation talks about, that's hell in plain English. Pride, disobedience, death. That's the fall of the angels, that's the fall of humanity, the original sin. And that is the prototype of all sin. What is God's plan? God wills not the death of the sinner. God wills that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what God wills. That is God's plan. And in order to effect that plan, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Incarnation. And then what happened? Jesus, who had assumed that human nature, he took it to a cross. He suffered, he died, and he rose on the third day, the Paschal Mystery. Now, that's God's plan. Incarnation, redemption. Redemption is not an arm's length transaction. Redemption is something that we have to participate in. God created us without us. God will not save us without us. As St. Augustine says. God created us without us. God will not save us without us. We have been given the same essential faculties as the angels, intellect and will. We have a free will. We have a mind. Our intellect is ordained toward truth, the free will toward the good. And as long as our mind is oriented toward truth and moving towards it and illuminated by it, we're going in the right direction. And then the will has to be fixed to the good. When the will is under the direction of the intellect, things go well. When it's not, they don't. The result, hell. Things go well, heaven. Period. Simple. You know, when I finish my doctorate in sacred theology, some good person came up to me and said, Father, you know, you have five university degrees now. You've got a doctorate in theology. Tell me, what, what, um, on what level do you teach? Uh, or do you teach in a university? You know, at what level do you teach? I said, kindergarten. <laughs> that's the way it was from the beginning, and that's the way it is now. Kindergarten. Any child can get this. It is very simple. In the end, winner, loser, heaven, hell. Good, evil, truth, lies. Take your pick. You have a free will. Now listen, it's always a pleasure to come to be with wonderful people like you. I feel comfortable with you. You are my family. You are truly the church. But I tell you, I don't have any time nowadays. I know I don't have to tell you this, but I just make it as a general statement. I'm tired of the rather spineless, mealy mouth, effeminate way we often present the doctrine of the faith. I have no time. You know, they say, well, yeah, but you know, you're not. One time a bishop said to me, yes, but Father, you must work for a constituency. 
And one time he said, he's a good man too, by the way, not a bad man. He, he said, now John, I want you to be smooth. <laughs> Bishop, who are you talking to? <laughs> you better discuss that with God because maybe he can make me smooth, but I certainly can't make me smooth. I'm, I'm too direct to be smooth. I could never be a politician. We don't have time to mess around. I have been given a tremendous charism. Do you know what the greatest gift God has given me is? I don't give a fat rat's you know what, who likes me and who doesn't. And I'm deadly serious about that. Now, I, I, I would want you to do what God wants you to do, but whether or not you're like me in the process, I really don't care. And I don't have time to mess around with silly argumentations. I don't even engage in apologetics. I preach and I teach from a position of authority. And that's how it always was in the church. Those who are disposed for truth receive it. Those who are not do not. Very early on I learned a very important thing. Things are received according to the mode of the receiver. And that means I can't become offended or depressed because somebody doesn't accept what I have to say. Listen, a lot of people didn't accept what Jesus Christ had to say. And they left him. They went away from him. And then they crucified him. So who am I to think everybody should accept what I have to say? But it's very simple. Arrogance disobedience, death. That is what the devil's attack is. Now man's opportunity is to accept God's plan, to accept the reality of the incarnation, to accept the reality that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, that Jesus is not only our Lord and Master, our Savior, but He is our brother. And He does understand us. And He loves us with a merciful love beyond your wildest dreams. Now our opportunity is to participate in the life and mission of Jesus Christ. Now, now what does that life and mission concern? Redemption! The salvation of souls. And every one of us is called to participate in that, each one according to his state in life. Priests do it in a certain way, religious do it in a certain way, married lay people do it in their way, and single lay people do it in their way. We all do the same thing in accordance with our state in life. It's not so easy though. That's our opportunity, all right. You know what your opportunity is? To be Christ right where you are, to become the living presence of Jesus Christ. Nothing less than that, to become Jesus. Now look, I, I realize it's not so easy. You say, yes, but I don't feel very much like Jesus sometimes. See, he's the Lord. He's all holy. Yes, I understand that. I don't feel that way either, most of the time. But don't sell yourself short. You say, but how can I become like Christ? It's called sanctifying grace. Do you know what sanctifying grace is? I'll give, once again, teaching on the kindergarten level, which is the only level that I can teach on. Sanctifying grace, quite simply, is a share in divine life. That's really what it is. You can come up with complicated explanations, but that's all it really is. A share in divine life. Now, through the sacraments, we receive sanctifying grace. We receive power to become who we are the body of Christ. We actualize our potential. Now listen, when enough of us take that seriously, when enough of us become disposed for grace, receive the grace, and then put that grace into action, the world will change. Right now, the devil seems to have the upper hand. Now, I have a, a background in business, the military, 
athletics. I can tell you that in every one of those spheres of action, every one of those disciplines, it is a tremendous advantage to know the outcome. Every once in a while I'll be moaning and groaning about the state of affairs in the world or even the church. And if I happen to be visiting my mother, sometimes she will take a Bible, shake her head, and say, Oh yes, my son, the priest, theologian. We know the last chapter. We won. And that's all you need to know. We won. Now, if you were going to play a football game this afternoon, and you knew somehow in advance you're going to win that game, you wouldn't be frightened. You know, fear is one of the most immobilizing things imaginable. Fear of failure. Fear of rejection. Fear of the future. All kinds of fear shackles us, immobilizes us, renders us weak. Don't be afraid. Fear not, little flock. It has pleased your Father to grant you a kingdom. And we have won that victory in Jesus Christ. The only question is, will we accept that victory? You have it in Christ. Now you've got to accept it and put it into action. That's man's opportunity to become the living presence of Jesus Christ. That's called holiness. What does it mean to be holy? It means to become who you are, the body of Christ. How do you do that? You become like Jesus. Well, how do I know what Jesus is like? Well, that's what your mother, the church, teaches you. Do you read the Bible with the mind of the church? Do you study the catechism of the Catholic Church? Now, you see, those things are bare, a bare beginning. Those are essentials. Would you be comfortable going over a bridge built by an engineer who felt that mathematics was unimportant? Would you feel comfortable having brain surgery by a surgeon who didn't believe in anatomy? Certainly not. Well, listen. What's more important than all of that is your faith. Because your faith is what gets you to heaven. So learn it. And don't make any silly excuses. Like that commercial said, just do it. Just do it. Listen, there's no excuse for anyone in this room not to be an expert on the Catholic faith. We've been given a great gift in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I, I began to read it when the first draft came out. I've read it many, many, many times. I still consider myself a novice, an amateur, because there's so much more to learn. Nonetheless, read it. It isn't that difficult. It isn't brain surgery. You can do it. If you can read, you can come to understand the essentials of your faith. And even if you can't, you can get it orally. That's why we have audio tapes. But most of you can read. And so read the catechism, study it, learn it. When I was in the Army, I remember I, I went in April 19th, 1967 is when I entered. You never forget the day, I guess. And Vietnam was going on. And we went into training, basic training, advanced infantry training, on and on and on. So much training. And we had a training cadre every place I went. They were experienced soldiers. And the experienced soldiers, boy, they usually were tough guys. Battle-hardened. Some of them had several purple hearts, silver stars. They'd been there and done that. They knew all about war. And they were hard on us. Why were they hard on us? They were hard on us for the same reason that my football coach in high school was hard on us. They wanted us to win, not lose. They wanted us to live, not die. I'll never forget when I went into high school. You've heard me tell this story, some of you. But my football coach, I never thought I'd learn as much as I did from him. But he was a big, tough, rough guy. And I remember we got there first day of practice. It was hot, humid, 
in August, and he ran us until every man dropped on the ground. I mean, he ran us around the track, laps, oh, constantly. I mean, it was terrible. Then he ran us up and down the practice field doing wind sprints until every single person had collapsed and was lying prostrate, sick, throwing up, and then he walked through the fallen bodies in his formal attire. He always wore formal attire to practice. That was a t-shirt and Bermuda shorts. And he walked amidst the fallen bodies, this big hairy man, and he looked down and he smiled and laughed and he said, Welcome to football, ladies. And it went downhill from there. He ran us to within an inch of our lives. He pushed us beyond our endurance. He forced us, he forced us to do things we didn't think we could do. They did the same thing in training when I was in the army. Boy, they'd get us up at midnight and we would march 30 miles. 30 miles we'd go in a day with packs and rifles through the swamp. I ate more red clay in Georgia and North Carolina and Alabama. And you thought you were going to die. You'd go, you'd have five minutes to eat. Then you'd go to bed and collapse and you'd be sleeping two, three hours and in came this enormous drill instructor with a smoky bear hat and a garbage can cover pounding it, turning your bunk upside down. Time to do it again. And we hated them. But you know what? They were trying to make us winners. They didn't want us to be losers because to be a loser meant to be dead in the military. Now, we have another game, we have another war, the only one that matters, the war to end all wars, the war for souls. God's plan is that not one of us be lost. But many of us do not take that plan to heart. We don't accept it. We don't accept grace. We reject it. Grace is made available, but it is received directly proportional to the disposition of the one receiving it. And that explains why a lot of people can go to Holy Communion every day and make little progress. You know why? Because they're not well disposed. I'll give you an analogy, another one of my kindergarten analogies. I'm only able to teach on a low, simple level. As one time it was said of me, you know, when they say about Mother Angelica, when they introduce her, she's the foundress of EWTN, the Monastery of Lady of Angels, and she's a wonderful person, dear friend of mine. And then they'd introduce old Father Fessio one way, and, you know, they all these buildings, and they did a review one time of my catechism series and concluded this man is an absolute simpleton. I kind of liked it. It was a liberal theologian who did it. But I rather liked it, considering where it came from. But I rather liked it because God, by definition, is pure simplicity. So one who teaches the things of God who's a simpleton might not be all that bad after all. So I didn't mind it too much. But it's very, very simple. Imagine you have a farm, and the farmland is desert very dry, barren, no water, and you can't grow anything because there's no water. You know you need water to, to grow something. So you put in an irrigation system. You bring in water from the outside. Some of my friends, my rancher friends in Wyoming do that. They irrigate. Out in California, you've got to irrigate because it doesn't rain all summer. And so the water comes in and things grow. That's grace. Grace. No grace. No life. But sometimes the pipes will get clogged up, the drainage ditches will collapse, and the water doesn't get through. One time I was preaching in Florida, and someone leaped to their feet in a moment of near ecstasy and said, Glory be to God, thank you for Father Karapi, the rotor rooter of my soul. <laughs> Now, I have never had a compliment quite like that. But you get the point, right? Sin, a poor disposition, lack of zeal, that kind of clogs up the pipes, right? The grace can't flow freely through, water the garden. 
and result in spiritual and moral growth and ultimately eternal life. Now it's that simple. That's God's plan, man's response to it, man's opportunity to accept grace, to live in grace. Now, the monkey wrench, the devil. We have enemies. Now anyone, I've got to make a footnote, I'm always making footnotes. I probably don't have to do that here because you good people know all this, but I, I do it anyway. Anyone who does not believe in the existence and the activity of Satan and the fallen angels is a heretic. Can I say it any more clearly than that? Hmm? Read my lips. Now, I have been continually amazed, if not saddened, and even angered, in recent years, that so many people who should know better, so-called educated people, teachers, professors, theologians, those with many, many degrees, have lost their mind and their faith. And they will hold things that are absolutely impossible to hold and yet be Catholic. And yet they get away with it day after day and year after year. And it is a mystery, more profound than the mystery of iniquity itself, that they could be allowed to continue to do this. Now, I told you about the one that when I preached way back at the beginning, when I finished my doctorate, I was invited to fill in. Somebody couldn't make it at the conference, so somebody invited me. They didn't know me at all. I was totally unknown. And I was sitting there and some very liberal theologians giving a talk and he said, well, you know, angels aren't real. Angels are merely literary devices. And he droned on and on. And you know, uh, we really don't believe, I don't know who we is, I guess it was him. But you know, we don't really believe in purgatory because, well, God wouldn't have any kind of suffering. And of course, we really don't believe in hell. God could never have a hell. God is certainly too merciful and good to ever allow a hell or damnation or anything like that. And then finally he finished. The old lady couldn't hardly stand it. And wouldn't you know it? He went down and he sat right next to her. She had reached that age where she just didn't care. If you know what I mean. And she just couldn't stand it. And finally she leaned over and whispered in his ear, Father, you don't believe in hell? He says, oh, no, no, no. He says, well, you'll believe it when you get there. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's very simple. You know, I mean, some people, they get educated. They, one of the occupational hazards of a higher education is arrogance, hmm? pride. You think you know it all. I remember the day that I received my doctorate in Spain at the University of Navarre. My the mentor, the director of my doctoral thesis said to me, Now, Father, you've gone through all the education you can. You've got five degrees, including a doctorate. Now, on this day that you're pretty much finished with your formal education, I want you to tell me, what have you learned? <laughs> it was one of those moments that Jesus talked about when he, when he remember, he said, that, Don't worry about what you're to say. Your father will give you the word. Well, I didn't even think about it. I said, what have you learned? I said, I've learned that I don't know anything. And he said, ah, oh, you're an educated man. <laughs> and, and what do we know? I mean, we know, really, what God reveals to us. Now, we can know certain things. Certainly, God has revealed things to us. We can know those things and should. But as St. Thomas Aquinas said, as such a brilliant mind, a great philosopher and theologian, it, it, at the end of his life, he said, all, all of this is but a little straw. He understood that all the knowledge that you could possibly accumulate when compared with the infinite knowledge and wisdom, which is God himself, how small it is. And so, you know, we aren't to become proud, arrogant. 
so that's that's the beginning of the end once we do that now even Jesus himself teaches us the lesson St. Paul's letter to the Philippians here's the crux of it my friends if there is any encouragement in Christ any incentive of love any participation in the spirit any affection and sympathy complete my joy by being of the same mind having the same love being in full accord and of one mind do nothing from selfishness or conceit but in humility in humility count others better than yourselves let each of you look not only to his own interest but also to the interests of others have this mind among yourselves which was the mind of Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human estate, he humbled himself and became obedient. Notice, humbled himself and became obedient. Not pride, disobedience. Humbled himself and became obedient. Obedient even unto death death on a cross. And thus it was that God his Father exalted the name of Jesus above every other name so that at the name of Jesus every knee must bend in the heavens on the earth and under the earth and every tongue proclaim to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ is Lord. My brothers and sisters Humility, obedience, life. Pride, disobedience, death. It is that simple. Winner, loser, heaven, hell. Humble yourself and be obedient. Now Satan's attack comes in the form of pride. Many, many disguised forms of pride. Now let me tell you though what humility is not. A lot of people get deceived on this. Humility and obedience are very, very important things. Essential. Essential. But don't be deceived by a false concept. The great, great doctor of the church, St. Teresa of Avila, Teresa of Jesus, great doctor, great saint, great foundress of the, the discalced Carmelites, St. Teresa would say, humility is truth. Remember that. Humility is truth, the acknowledgement of truth. God is the, is the creator. God is all-powerful. I am a creature. God is everything. I am nothing, however, even though I'm just a speck in the universe, God loves the speck. That's the truth. That's humility. I have nothing that I have not been given. That's the truth. That's humility. However, I have been given much. That's the truth. That's humility. To deny the truth is false humility. Saying, oh, I'm no good. I have nothing. I can do nothing. No, you can't on your own. But God has given you gifts. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. I'm weak. Listen, you people don't really know me. If you did, you wouldn't be treating me so good. I am ornery. I am weak. I am inclined to quit. I am quick to discouragement. I'm a joke. But God is stronger than all that. It is when I am weak that I am strong. God's mighty power is brought to perfection in weakness. What happens when we're humbled? Do you know, now I'm going to give you an example. One time a lady came to me and said, Father, please pray for me because for my faith. I, I have weak faith and I need stronger faith. Would you please pray for me? I said, certainly I will. A week later she came back to me and said, you didn't pray for me. And said, oh, yes, I did. And I could have finished the story. He said, no, you couldn't have prayed for me. I said, oh, yes, I did. And that's why everything started going bad. 
I said, what? I said, now isn't that true? Things turned from bad to worse? Yes, they did. And it has sorely tested my faith. If something is to grow, it must be exercised. You want stronger arms? Exercise them. Stronger legs? Exercise them. Stronger faith? It must be exercised. Stronger hope? What is humiliation? The exercise of humility. We don't like to be humiliated. We don't like to look silly. But it's good for us. Why? Because that humiliation exercises us in the virtue of humility. And that humility capacitates us to obey. We live in an age of arrogant disobedience. The known serviette of Lucifer rings out in every corner of the world. It has even permeated the church herself. Oh yes, the Trojan horse has entered the city of God. And he has entered it as arrogance which results in disobedience. I was at a dinner one time at a parish mission. Several priests were invited. I wasn't giving the mission. But it was in, in a place close to where I grew up, and the pastor had asked me to come over. I was home, so I did. About a dozen priests. We had dinner, and uh, the pastor went over to get the church ready for the mission that night. And we sat there drinking coffee. And one of the priests said, Oh, what do you think of the Pope's new encyclical? It was uh, Veritati Splendor. When it first came out, when the Holy Father's encyclical on the splendor of truth came out, and he clarified many teachings. Well, what do you think about that? And one of them said, yeah, he's got a lot of nerve telling us what to do. And I watched in utter amazement as they worked themselves up into a frenzy like, well, like a school of sharks tearing into meat. They hated him. And they, and finally, I mean, the rage, they were screaming. And finally the ringleader turned on me and said, well, what do you think about it? And so I told him for an hour. <laughs> Satan's attack. You can be like God's. Deciding for yourselves what's good and what's evil for you. Deciding for yourselves subjectively and arbitrarily what is true. We are church. We are church. The arrogant, defiant cry goes out. And what's behind it is we will decide what the church teaches. A consensus will determine the church's position on this, that, or the other thing. We are church. Behind it is Satan. His arrogant, defiant, disobedient cry. Watch out. For we are indeed church. We are church to the degree we accept church teaching and live the church's life of holiness. We are not church. To the degree we reject church teaching and reject the church's authentic life of holiness. No, when we do that, we are anti-church. And if anti-church anti-Christ. For Christ and his church are one. Watch out for Satan's attack. Watch out for pride. It can sneak up on you. It, oh, it happens to me all the time. You've just got to be vigilant. You've got to be careful. Because it is humility which enables you to obey. We are, I hope, obedient. We should be obedient to legitimate authority. Now, I have to clarify that. What if someone, I'll give you an example. We go back several decades. Hitler is in power. And Hitler orders certain things. The extermination of peoples. And certain officers carry out the orders, middle management. Not just the Jews. Many Catholics, other Christians, died in Auschwitz, Dachau. 
Later, the war ended, and they had the war crimes trials at Nuremberg. And these men were accused of these atrocities. But we were just following orders, and they hung them. Well, what's the difference? What's the difference? You end up with a leader who takes a position opposed to a higher leader. You have a theologian or a bishop or a priest who takes a position in faith and morals that is opposed to what the Holy Father and the Magisterium are teaching. Is it obedience to follow the disobedient? No, that is disobedience when you know the difference. Now, some people don't know the difference. They should follow the leader, but you should inform yourself. Now, this is not a small thing. And I, you know, when I was younger, they would say, they would say, now, Father, take it easy. You know, you, nobody really does this. Nobody disobeys. You know, no priest would do that. No bishop would do that. No theologian would do that. They were lying to me. I am now older. I have more scars. And I don't give a you-know-what. Because I know what the score is. I've sat in meetings with bishops and theologians, colloquies of bishops and scholars, they call them. I sat between two bishops one time on a conference on moral theology. And at the break, one of the bishops said to me, you know, we're wasting our time this conference on moral theology. The real problem concerns birth control. Until we come out and publicly denounce Pope Paul VI and Humanae Vitae, we're wasting our time. Now myself and my priest for 20 years have been counseling people that if they need to take the birth control pill, go ahead. The bishop said that to me. And that has happened time and time again. To my face, I didn't read that on the front page of The Wanderer. It happened right in my face. And you know why that can happen? Because too many Catholics are uninformed. Because too many Catholics don't know their faith. And most of all, because too many Catholics sit on their fat backsides and don't care which way it goes. That's the problem. Indifference. Moral indifference. And your moral indifference will lead you to a disastrous situation wherein the church begins to decline. The moral fabric inside begins to unravel. And then what happens? The whole world unravels. It's happening now. Why is the world in a mess? Because the church is in a mess. Why is the world sinking into hell? under the weight of its own iniquity because we have grown weary of holding it up. Do you remember what happened in the Old Testament when Moses and the chosen people were fighting Amalek's army? Moses went up on the high ground like a good commander and he was. Now as long as Moses kept his arms upraised in prayer the battle went well for Israel but Moses being a man, became tired, and his arms began to sag, and then the battle went badly for Israel. Remember that. So they propped up Moses' arms. That's the church. We have grown tired of doing what we should do because it's hard. Why? The world pounds on us. We become weary of standing up strong, of taking a moral stand, of being a stumbling block, of being a contradiction, as Jesus is. We don't like that. We want to be liked. We want to be accepted. We don't like people bad-mouthing us. We don't like to be rejected at all. And what happens? Because of that, we do not stand up. You know what you need to stand? A backbone. No backbone you cannot stand. You will stand for nothing and fall for everything. And so it is. So it is. Too many of us. Too many of our leaders. 
My brothers and sisters, God has a plan, and it's good. Man has an opportunity. It's very, very beautiful. It's great. But Satan has an attack. And the attack comes in the form of that arrogance, which results in disobedience to God's law. Disobedience against the Holy Father, against the magisterium. That disobedience leads to death. The second death of the book of Revelation. And the signs all along the way or even physical death. Look around you. Look around this universe we live in today. From the moment of conception to the last moment of natural life and all points in between, from abortion to euthanasia with suicide and violence, death stalks humanity. We live in a culture of death, and that is the sign of the moral unraveling of the universe. And so we have to have a counterattack to Satan's attack. And I'm now going to tell you what it is. It's very simple. It's very simple. You already know it. And I'm just going to confirm you in what you already know. First, you must have a relationship with our Blessed Mother. She is your mother. Love her. Time and time again, I have found that where people think they don't need her, they're too arrogant or pseudo-educated or sophisticated to bother with the Blessed Mother, they fall. She has been given special power in this age of the devil. And this is a violent, violent spiritual warfare. And Our Lady, clothed with the Son, her Son, has been given power to help us. Don't have just a devotion. I want you to have a relationship. If you have a mother, you're devoted to her, but you have a relationship with your mother. Have a relationship with Our Lady. Do you talk to her every day? Are there signs of her in your house, or have you, or have you evicted her from the premises, like they have in many churches? They've evicted the Mother of God. Now, let me tell you something very simply. If I had any power, and I don't, if you needed a special favor from me, let me tell you how not to get it. Insult my mama. Hmm? Oh, you say, oh, I wouldn't insult her, I just ignore her. Uh-huh. That's insulting her. Listen, you need a relationship with Our Lady. Pray the rosary. Time and time again, once on television I was asked, Pray the rosary, yeah. Well, you know that. You know it, and you've got to radiate it to everybody else, because there's a lot of people who don't know it. Do you know why I do these things? Uh, people have often said to me, Father, why do you bother talking to the choir? You know, you're preaching to the choir. Those people don't need it. Yes, they do. You need it because you need to be confirmed in your faith, because you're the ones who go out into the world and transform it. I'm like the coach, right? You're the team. I'm the coach. I'm exhorting you, trying to train you and prepare you. Then you go out and fight the battle. You go out and win the game. Very important. Pray the rosary. Why? Because it's pure power. Why? Because to pray the rosary is to pray the Gospels. Pray the Gospels. Look at it. The 15 mysteries. Look at those mysteries. Right out of the Gospels. What's the Gospel? Word means good news. What's the good news? The good news isn't something. The good news is somebody. Jesus Christ is the good news. When you pray the rosary, you're praying Christ. The Our Father, the Hail Mary, it's Christ-centered. What happens? You begin to interiorize Jesus. You become who you are. The body of Christ, filled with power and able to go out and do the works of the Master. You'll heal the sick. Give sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf. Did, did you know? You don't know about some of these gifts I have. Did you know I could raise the dead? You didn't know that? Oh, yes. I have a particular gift. Now, uh, and matter of fact, every priest I know has the gift to raise the dead. Mm -hmm. Dead ones walk in the confessional and living ones walk out.
We preach, and if people are disposed, those who are blind and deaf to the truth receive their sight and their hearing. Lo and behold, they can finally hear the truth, and it resonates and makes them happy. And so, number one, have a relationship with Our Lady and pray her rosary. Number two, have absolute, uncompromising fidelity to the Holy Father and His teaching. Don't be a dissident. The first dissident was Lucifer. Don't follow him. The operative word is assent. We give the assent of faith, and then we're blessed. And third, the Eucharist. Oh, the Eucharist, the power of God. The greatest gift the loving God ever gave to his beloved people. The Holy Eucharist, Jesus himself, his passion, death, and resurrection. Make a holy hour. Be reverent when you go to Mass. Have great reverence and participate. And active participation, first and foremost, means from your heart and your mind. Be recollected. Be recollected. Be in union with Christ crucified at Mass. And you, offering your life through Him, with Him, and in Him, will be one with the Savior in fighting this good fight. Yes, God has a plan, the incarnation and redemption. Man has an opportunity to participate in the life and mission of Jesus Christ, the salvation of souls. And yes, Satan attacks us. He attacks those who work for God even more. But Satan's attack can be counterattacked. Love Our Lady. Pray the Rosary. Be faithful to the Holy Father and the Magisterium's teaching. And third, have a great love for the Holy Eucharist. And if you will do those things, fighting the good fight and running the race to the finish line, I promise you, when this battle's over, you and I are going to stand before Almighty God, and you're going to hear the beautiful words, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you. God love you. And goodbye.